use of biological controls in field scale fruit and vegetable production. Biocontrols are pretty commonplace in greenhouses now and in, and in the field in more temperate parts of the world, but how can we incorporate them into field production in our rather uh, cool climate? It is a balmy minus 25 with the wind chill today. Uh, so, so it seems ra ra rather relevant. Um, our expert today uh, will chat about some of his experiences in different crops and the applications that he's seen. So Ronald Valentin was born in the heart of the greenhouse industry in the Netherlands. His family owned a greenhouse operation and his father started using biological control in 1971 at a very, I would say, I think it's safe to say that your father was an early adopter there, Ronald. Um, yes. At a very young age, Ronald developed an interest for the bugs and as a teenager he was managing and producing the biological control agents for the family greenhouse operation. After finishing his education in crop protection management, biochemistry, and vegetable production at State Secondary College of Agriculture, oh goodness gracious, here's where I stumble, in Delir, the Netherlands, he embarked on a career in biological control in 1986. After working in biological control technical support in the Netherlands and several other European countries, he came to Canada for his first visit in 1996. After traveling to Canada once every six to seven weeks in 96 and 97, he immigrated to Canada uh, in December of 1997. In March 2004, he became a Canadian citizen. Over the years, Ronald has worked with many growers to set up sustainable and effective pest management programs with a focus to use biological control agents as a first line of defense. He's also trained and managed technical support teams in Europe, Canada, and the US. Ronald is currently technical lead and commercial manager for BioLine AgroSciences in North America and director for BioLine Canada, Inc. Ronald is very passionate about making an IPM and biological control approach work for each and every grower, as well as reducing the use of pesticides for the better of the environment and the, and the future. And I believe you're also a, uh, a chicken breeder, if I am not mistaken, correct? Well, yes, we do some uh, some Dutch uh, Barneveld chickens. That's correct, uh, Dustin. Uh, Perfect. That's that'll, what, be, <laughs> that's, that'll be that's, another that's, webinar, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that for quite some time. So. Perfect. So uh, just let me turn it over to you here, and we'll get you uh, we'll get you up and on your way. Okay. The, okay. You should, you should just be able to um, share your screen there. Do you see this part right now? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, oh. If my screen had not just there, we go. There we are. Yes. Perfect. Okay. okay. Well, thanks for that introduction, uh, Dustin. And um, again, this this is fairly new for me too. I've uh, I've only done two webinars uh, in in the past, so. Um, um, looking forward to this uh, to get a little bit more familiar with the technology. Um, you know, as Dustin said, obviously biological control has been used for uh, for quite some time in the uh, in the greenhouse industry and primarily, um, especially first uh, couple of decades in the vegetable industry, um, and more recently in the last uh, uh, ten to fifteen years also in ornamental crops. Um, but what we also see happening now is that the interest uh, for field crops is definitely on the increase. Um, and um, um, obviously a lot of this presentation is talking about the general, um, general consensus of what needs to be done uh, to make a biocontrol system work. And I think one of the, uh, one of the things that we also uh, have to realize is that Often greenhouse growers, um, if we look at their turnover per square meter or per square foot, um, is quite substantially higher than field crops. So also keeping budgets in mind, we also have to look at that. And later in the presentation, I will be talking about uh, the implementation of banker plant systems, uh, which I think has a lot of uh, merit for, for field crops. And it is actually uh, going outdoors with, uh, with that. Um, there's a lot of uh, biocontrol already happening in, um, in strawberries in California, but also in Quebec and Ontario. So I will be touching on that uh, a little bit uh, as well. So uh, biocontrol in, uh, in produce crops, what, what uh, uh, solutions that work? I'm going to go uh, um, start here with, uh, with, the, uh, with the general presentation. And again, why do growers change to biological control? And, um, I have a couple of pictures to show you what uh, uh, um, the main reason for growers to talk, to change to biocontrol and, and, and this is why my father actually also embarked into biocontrol in 1971. It was not because of uh, green ideas or maximum residue limits or concern about uh, pesticide use, but it was strictly 
because of uh, uh, efficacy problems with the, the back then available pesticides for for his spider mite control and and uh, white fly control. Since then, we have obviously seen other pest problems becoming problematic as well. Um, here we see a picture of a cucumber crop um, uh, that is affected by thrips, and that little cucumber there on the on the right hand side um, is uh, what cucumber growers refer to as pigtails. Um, uh, in a very, very young stage in the growing tip, um, a thrip um, affects one of those very, very small cucumbers and when the, when the cucumber starts to grow, it, uh, it doesn't become a long English cucumber, but a curled English, English cucumber. Um, obviously spider mite, I mentioned that that was one of the reasons why my father switched back in 1970, 1971. Obviously if you have uh, losses like this, uh, that's uh, not really sustainable. Um, so um, other solutions uh, um, are looked for and obviously in greenhouses, uh, greenhouses are uh, doing pro crop after crop so also um, compared to field crops the, um, there are many more, many more life cycles throughout the year. Uh, spider mite can have 26 to th uh, sorry 24 to 36 generations uh, per year uh, which obviously gives them a lot more chance to uh, build up resistance. This is in the bell pepper crop in the greenhouse. Um, again, you see the webbing. Um, that's quite substantial. Um, this is white fly in tomatoes, uh, which also can be uh, uh, a problematic pest. And uh, Dustin was mentioning minus a whopping minus 25. And um, it is known that um, frost does not always... Uh, fix the problem so to speak because greenhouse whitefly pupa can actually handle up to minus 37 Celsius and survive. So um, frost does not always mean that there's less problems uh, problems with certain insects. Uh, Bemisia whitefly, the other whitefly species uh, cannot handle any frost and that's why that particular species is not very common in Canada unless it's brought in on, um, on cuttings that are or plant material that comes in from the south. So again, why do biocontrol, why do growers change to biocontrol? The number one reason is still efficacy problems uh, with, with pesticides. Pesticides no longer working as well as they did. One of the examples uh, that is more recent is uh, spinozot. Um, uh, spinozot used to work very well on thrips and unfortunately for many growers it's uh, not as effective as it, uh, as it used to be. And of course when that happens and you spray and spray and spray, cost versus result also becomes uh, becomes an issue. But there are also other drivers now to uh, to make a change. The market and, and customer and consumer demands are, are um, becoming more and more uh, 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 a, uh, a social issue. Um, MRLs, maximum residue limits. Uh, my brother-in-law in the Netherlands who is a Bell pepper grower um, has to has has to have his uh, bell peppers checked every two weeks by an independent organization that uh, checks his peppers on residues, so that becomes uh, more of a more of an issue too. Also, uh, REIs, work environment, uh, resistance management, uh, and also the next generation growers and farmers are much more um, in tune and and are willing to uh, to look at other opportunities. And there's more and more positive stories from growers who have a high level of a high level of success. And then, last but not least, also environmental concerns. So, what are reasons for biological control to fail? Dustin, can can the uh, um, can the audience also uh, uh, respond? Uh, that's that's a good question. Let's see. Um, can I? Quickly set up a poll. How technologically savvy am I? Uh, um, if, if not, I will keep going. But because uh, I'm wondering if people have ideas about why, what are the reasons for bar control to fail? Let's see. Let's just try this for just for funsies here. Okay. Um, oh, it's going to make me. Okay, so I can't do wide open answer. I have to have some examples of reasons. Okay. And people have to. Uh, yeah, multiple choice. So. Okay. Well, you know, one of the main reasons for biological control to fail is um, is timing. And what we uh, what we see is that 
uh, one of the main differences between traditional control with traditional pesticides versus biological control is that it is a lot more proactive versus reactive approach. In other words, um, uh, we see sometimes people respond to pest uh, levels where biological control is really designed to keep these pest levels from actually establishing. So um, a little bit later in the presentation I will explain that on the hand of uh, Western flower thrips and um, it will become a little bit more clear why it's so important to start early. So you know again I have uh, I have this slide followed by some pictures you know um, here we see Western flower thrips um, in cucumbers at about uh, 68 Fahrenheit 20 Celsius um, and you can see that one female thrip um, in about 60 days develops into about 5,800 thrips. Um, obviously once you have that 5,800 thrips you have a significant problem on your hands um, and this is approximately at that temperature about three and a half generation because every generation from egg to adult is about 18 days. Now at the point of the 90 thrips, so in the center uh, where you see approximately 90 adult thrips, you actually don't realize you have a problem yet. You see that there's some thrips around but it's not problematic although the train has already left the station and it's it, the problem is in the making and it's really hard at that point to uh, to jump in. Now 5800 thrips this is in a cucumber crop. If this, this, was, this was to be in a pepper crop it would be um, a lot higher. This 5800 would be a lot higher and the main reason is that uh, long English cucumbers, the flowers, there's only female flowers, there's no male flowers, so there's no pollen production and pollen has a tremendous impact on the development of thrips. Um, the egg laying capacity of one female thrip um, um, can increase quite dramatically uh, when there's a pollen source available. For example, in bell pepper crops without pollen, so before the plants are starting to flower, uh, western flower thrips produce, pr a female produces approximately three to four eggs per female but as soon as it uh, uh, produces flowers and there's high protein pollen available that can go as high as 15 eggs per female. So needless to say that this, if it would say peppers instead of cucumbers, this picture would be, uh, be very different. Now the critical thing here is uh, starting early um, is um, in most cases success. We're starting too late and it often leads to, uh, leads to disappointment. Same thing for whitefly. This is uh, a whitefly in tomatoes uh, where one female uh, 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 leads to about 8,000 adults in, uh, in about 64 days um, and uh, needless to say that, that uh, that's problematic um, and again catching it early really is, uh, is very important. Uh, whitefly does have different egg laying capacity uh, it, uh, uh, per, per plant species. On tomatoes uh, the females produce in their lifetime approximately 100 to 125 eggs but that same female white flying cucumbers is around 200 and on tobacco or eggplants it goes as high as 800 uh, in her lifetime so it, it definitely responds to the plant species that it's uh, that it's on. So again what are reasons for biological control to fail? Starting too late is the number one reason. Um, it's uh, uh, we see that over and over again that uh, reactive versus proactive uh, it's really really important to start early. Um, we also often hear you know I'm, I'd like to try biological control and you have to be really careful with that uh, with this because um, uh, especially when we're talking about multi multi species crops so there's multiple pests um, around and we've seen this in ornamental crops where growers are really struggling with uh, with thrips but are uh, able to fairly easily control uh, aphids for example um, uh, with uh, with the traditional chemicals um, if you're you're not looking at your aphid control with biological control as well then the traditional control products that you're using for your aphids could potentially also give problems for your uh, for your thrip control so you really have to uh, to look at uh, at uh, at a commitment there. Not starting clean is also very important, and that not only counts for pests on young plant material that comes in, but also residues of uh, insecticides, 
certain insecticides such as uh, orthene uh, can have a very long residual effect on biological control agents um, up to 16 weeks um, so you have to keep in mind that young plant material also needs to be not only clean from a pest perspective but also residues of insecticides is uh, can be an issue now there are obviously products that are much shorter have much shorter residual uh, so not all pesticides are bad and they're actually even some products that are compatible with uh, with biologicals. Scouting and monitoring is very important. And again, I mentioned that reactive versus proactive. Uh, proactive with biological control is really important. Uh, not taking all pests and disease problems into consideration. Um, and also poor planning. Um, biological control agents do need to be produced and also uh, need to be shipped. So keep in mind that you, uh, you have to uh, think about that ahead of time a little bit, uh, especially if we talk about uh, large quantities, that's really uh, important. Poor management application is, is also very, very important. Um, um, if you don't apply the product correctly, then um, it's, it's also not going to work. Technical support, which is what we're talking about right now, but also field technical support, it's a good idea if you are thinking about doing something like this, that you have somebody to, uh, to give you that backup um, those biological control agents are shipped um, um, from across the world. We have several production sites. Um, one is in Oxnard, California, but there's also production sites in Europe, in the UK, in France. And um, so, um, some of these biologicals are shipped uh, shipped to you, and it's always a good idea to uh, do some random checks on um, on the quality when uh, when you bring it in. Another thing is fear of loss and, and bailing tip uh, bailing at the tipping point and uh, that has a lot to do with trust and I think in the, one of the next slides I um, talk about that a little bit more. Expectations versus thresholds and compatibility with traditional uh, crop protection products is also very important which we have a, a good tool on uh, that you can download on your uh, on your smartphone. Uh, that actually has a side effect list with uh, with products, traditional crop protection products, and whether they are compatible with biological control agents or not. Um, so if I look at this plant here uh, and I ask the question, should I spray or not? Uh, well, there's really only two two options that yes or no but now obviously elaborating why it would be yes or why it would be no. Um, I wonder how many people are saying yes and how many people are saying no. Um, but there's one thing that you um, see on this pepper plant. And if you look at the growing tips, those growing tips are green and clean. And uh, sometimes we see growers that see this, obviously there has been some damage here from two spotted spider mite, but the minute you start to see those growing tips turn green, it means that the Phytocelius persimilis or the predatory mite for two spotted spider mite actually has overcome the two spotted spider mites, uh, which as a reaction of the plant, the plant starts to show new green growing tips. Um, obviously spraying at this point does not make a lot of sense um, because uh, the tipping point has been reached uh, and one of these persimilis, uh, you see the picture on the right there, that little red mite um, clawing onto a uh, two-spotted spider mite. One of those mites kills about six adult spider mites or 20 spider mite eggs per day. So once that population gets going, it really uh, can overcome that spider mite population. Obviously, the earlier you start with spider mite, again, the lower the uh, the damage uh, level to your crop gets. Um, but the tipping point is often what people in biological control are talking about. Again, um, biological control release rates, when and where to start. Um, I don't know um, the growers that are attending to this webinar, if you're bringing in liners or uh, young plant material from a, from a, a propagator, it really can help to already get some inoculations done there. Um, you see here um, one of the pictures, uh, the middle picture on the top with the with the blue 
uh, Syngenta BioLine uh, sachet there is on a young cucumber um, um, seeding, uh, these Rockwell blocks. You can just see the, uh, the cucumbers germinating. Um, this is what uh, cucumber growers do. Um, they really start as early as possible and again once I start talking about the thrips life cycle you'll understand why it is so critical. Um, the bottom below that is a pepper crop, very similar. Um, and uh, on the right hand side you also see some banker plants hanging up in the air there, um, the right top picture and the, on the top you see plants hanging in their hanging basket there um, that uh, supports aureus which is a bar control agent for, for thrips. Um, so the earlier the better. Again we see here uh, again cucumber propagation, uh, some happy growers there that uh, are ready to plant some uh, cucumber plants into their main uh, production facility. These sachets uh, um, are actually a little culture of predatory mites. Uh, this system was developed back in uh, in the early 90s, uh, where um, rather than sprinkling these predatory mites uh, every week onto the crop, is that is this is literally an extension of our production. In these little sachets, there's bran that is inoculated with a fungus and that fungus uh, is actually a food source for bran mites and the bran mites are a food source for the amblyseas mites so it's literally a little culture. Uh, the culture typically releases mites for four to six weeks and there's a little hole that is right underneath that flap um, where you see point four, five, and 3. There's a little hole under underneath that fold to protect it from, uh, from water. Um, and this sachet was designed to actually be also used outdoors and it is actually used outdoors in the summer in, um, in uh, pot chrysanthemums, field, field summer, fall chrysanthemums, as well as in strawberries uh, in uh, Ontario, Quebec and, and, uh, and California. So these sachets are designed to be able to withstand rain or overhead watering in, um, in a greenhouse. The paper is actually made out of water resistant paper. Here we see application in, on young pepper, pepper plants, uh, but you could imagine that this could also be done on, uh, on pluck trays of, uh, of field vegetables. Uh, this is a little later in the production. Um, and again, this is more a little bit about the actual thrips. Why is it so important to start early? Um, if we look at thrips, uh, the, the main uh, species that we're dealing with uh, that is causing trouble is frankly Niella occidentalis or western flower thrips, but there are other thrips species around as well. Um, but frankly Niella western flower thrips is the most common one to cause uh, trouble in, uh, in vegetables and also in strawberries out, out in the field. Uh, also frost would not necessarily kill uh, western flower thrips. It is known to uh, also survive winters in Quebec outside, so um, I'm not 100% sure, but um, it uh, would not surprise me if also Alberta, they would uh, overwinter as pupa in, in the soil in the field. It can be found all over the plant and it's uh, primarily the larvae and the adults that, uh, that do the damage. Uh, if we look at the life cycle of thrips um, at 68 Fahrenheit or 20 Celsius, the eggs are actually laid in the cell tissue, in the leaf tissue, um, so there's very little you can do about the eggs. Um, uh, and that stage at that temperature is about six days. And then we get two larval stages. Um, we often talk about L1 and L2 um, that are exposed. They are actually crawling around on the plant. So at the end of the egg stage, that egg actually, that larva crawls out out of the leaf tissue and is now on the plant and both of those stages are three days. Um, then we have the pupil stage which typically takes place in the soil or on the floor. Um, this is one of the reasons why we often see in greenhouse production that growers growing on flood floors, um, they typically have not no problems but sometimes less problems with thrips than traditional growers who have uh, gravel underneath benches or have more um, opportunities for thrips to uh, thrips to pupate. And then we get the adult uh, and those adults are again exposed on the plant. Uh, we often can find them in the flowers if there's flowers there. 
um, because they uh, they do like to feed on uh, on pollen. And this is one of the problems with thrips that those adults can sometimes live up to 60 days, so uh, causing causing a lot of trouble. And you can have multiple generations going um, at the same time. When the temperature goes up to 30 Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit, it kind of um, cuts almost in half. Uh, instead of 18 days from egg to new adult, it now is nine days. So needless to say that uh, when that happens, uh, it can really go, population can go up, up very, very rapidly. Here's the, uh, the most important part of this slide is that the Amblycia species or the predatory mite species that are in those sachets are actually only capable of feeding on larval stage one. So my window of opportunity to control thrips is only about uh, uh, one and a half to three days depending on the temperature. If it's a little cooler than 20 Celsius, it might be four days, but you don't have a lot of time. And once it gets past that L1 stage, uh, Amblyceus is unfortunately not going to help you. So this is the reason why these cucumber growers, if you remind that picture from a couple of slides ago, why they are uh, 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 so uh, insistent on uh, trying to get that uh, those Amblyceus mites established as early as possible. There are some other tools in the toolbox, uh, Hypoaspis miles or Stratiolelaps or Athida coriaria, uh, also called the Lothia coriaria right now. Um, they uh, are both soil dwelling uh, predators that are also native to, uh, to Canada. Um, they feed uh, primarily on fungus net and shoreflies, but also have a side effect on thrips pupa. And we specifically say side effect as it uh, um, maximum what we have seen in research is about 40% of the pupa. And then there's the adults. Uh, one of my favorite is aureus insidiosus. Uh, that actually can affect uh, can affect the adults. Um, one thing to remem remember is that thrips can transmit virus, um, but the virus is uh, uh, there's two two virus problems: TSWV and INSV. Uh, the virus is actually acquired by the larva, uh, and only by the larva. So an adult thrips that does not carry the virus already in its system cannot transmit the virus from a sick plant to a healthy plant. Um, so only a larva can actually absorb the virus and then when that larva becomes an adult, um, then that adult can actually transmit uh, the virus from plant to plant. That's a really important thing to remember because sometimes people panic when they uh, have virus. Um, um, as long as you control the larva, you also kind of control the virus as well. So here a little bit more information about the predatory mites. Uh, Amblyces cucumers is one of the most common uh, mites used. Um, it can handle uh, lower temper or cooler temperatures uh, up to about 15 Celsius. It doesn't mean that they will necessarily die below that temperature, but they become inactive. Um, um, so um, especially for field crops, I think uh, this particular mite is used in um, in uh, Ontario and Quebec, outside in strawberries, um, after the middle of May, uh, those sachets are placed, and um, uh, mites um, are coming out of those sachets, finding their way into the strawberry flowers where there's pollen available. And that's a good thing to remember too that these mites can also sustain themselves very well on pollen as well. So, um, one of those mites feeds on approximately three to four. L1s per day, larval stage of thrips per day. And they also have some side effect to broad mites as well. Amblyceus swirsky, I'm going to skip that fairly quickly because this mite is more a warmer temperature mite. Uh, it is used uh, 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 a lot more in the south, south of the US. Um, kind of has the same effect on thrips, but also in addition feeds on white fly eggs as well. And this is one of my favorite aureus. Aureus uh, is the only one that actually can affect adult thrips. Uh, it is also native to Canada. Uh, it often shows up in the summer, uh, late summer. We see it often in uh, evening crops where it hasn't been introduced. Uh, and it actually uh, has a piercing mouth part that uh, it stabs into thrips and then basically uh, um, 
sucks out the uh, the content. You actually see that yellow cucumber flower there. Um, it's actually an adult thrips that has a uh, an adult aureus that has an adult thrips on its uh, on its mouth part, uh, having a good time. Uh, one aureus can kill up to 80 thrips per day, so uh, not necessarily feeding on all 80, but uh, once it attacks the thrips and puts a hole in that thrips, that thrips is uh, is not going to survive. This is Hypoaspis, the little predatory mite that lives in the soil, also native to, to Canada. Um, it uh, lives in the top inch, inch and a half, three to five centimeters of the soil, um, and uh, feeds primarily on the thrips pupa, but also does fungus net larvae or shore fly as well. Um, this is also native. Um, often you can find this beetle, this rove beetle, in, uh, in if you have a compost pile, and you start digging in there, you can often find them naturally occurring. Um, um, also, the larvae as well as the adults are predaceous and feed on fungus net larvae, uh, shore fly larvae, uh, and thrips pupa. Are there any questions so far, Dustin? Dustin? Sorry, there we are. Mike okay. Uh We are being, we are good. Nothing so far. Okay, excellent. Excellent. So now a little bit about uh, banker plants, uh, because I think this is something that, especially in field crops, uh, can really uh, help to uh, not only establish, but also maintain some biological control agents. Um, this has been a development that is not from the last few years in, in the greenhouse industry, uh, but has recently, more recently gone outdoors. Um, this picture actually is from Gilroy, California at the Syngenta uh, flower site where they uh, you see that front row there with the white alyssum and the black purple plants the first row that goes along the field those are all uh, banker plants to support aureus so banker plants are basically a plant that uh, uh, supports a, uh, a biological control agents and sometimes it actually also supports a, a pest um, that actually in return is a host for uh, the biological control agent, but the idea there is, oh, sorry, is that the um, the, uh, the plant pest is very specific to a plant species. So I'll talk a little bit about, about that more in the aphid banker section. The three systems around are aphid banker systems uh, for aphid control, pepper banker plant systems in the support of aureus, and mullen plants in the support of uh, Dicyphus hesperus. So what, why banker plants? The banker plants is, uh, again, an idea to uh, reduce the reliance on pesticides and also increasing the use of biological control agent. Uh, we've seen over the years that uh, having those banker plants in the system, you get better efficacy just simply because of the fact that you have more and um, a better establishment and higher numbers of BCAs available in your crop. And, in a way, these banker plants are nothing different than that little sachet that I showed earlier. Uh, it's an open rearing system that supports uh, uh, support the beneficials um, to get established and um, get higher numbers uh, in the crop. Um, it's also about sustainability and efficiencies. Um, you know, a bar control. There's obviously a cost to bar control, but if you can uh, manage that uh, so that the costs stay within reason. Uh, it also makes it more suitable to uh, to be used. Sometimes there are short-term crops for long-term BCAs. Uh, what I mean to say with that, if you look at those long English cucumber crops, those crops are typically in for 13, 14 weeks maximum. Um, and to try to get aureus established takes 8 to 10 weeks. So sometimes uh, if you don't do banker plants, you actually throw the uh, beneficial insects out with the crop and uh, you have to start from scratch with uh, with a new crop that comes into greenhouse. Uh, what is very important to understand is that bar controls, uh, banker plants, is typically not a standalone system. You need to look at uh, a more holistic approach. Um, as you saw with thrips, it is a multi-prone, um, and some people have told me uh, the pitchfork approach. It is not just one bar control agent that actually does the trick, but the combination of two or three is actually capable of uh, keeping it under control. 
Um, so it's a part of an overall strategy. That's uh, that's what I'm trying to say. It's also sometimes not suitable for every crop setting. Um, for example, uh, growers that do ornamental crops in greenhouses followed by a poinsettia crop where thrips is really not a main issue to do an aureus banker system doesn't make too uh, too much sense. The banker plant system for aphid was developed in uh, in Europe. Uh, the first uh, research was done in Denmark in the late 80s, uh, later picked up by some of the Dutch uh, researchers, uh, one in particular was Dr. Pierre Ramakers, um, who worked uh, with a lot of the Dutch pepper and cucumber growers, and they were battling a new aphid species that uh, was hard to control uh, with traditional introductions of biological control. So they looked at other opportunities to try to uh, uh, keep this under control. And if you look at that picture, you see these hanging baskets with what looks like grass, which is actually winter barley and that winter barley is inoculated with a aphid species called Ropolacephum pati or cherry oat aphid that can only survive on mono, mono, uh, monocar plants. So uh, basically this aphid can only survive on grasses. But at the same time it's a very good host for the aphidias colomani uh, which is one of the, uh, the wasps that is used for the biocontrol, for biological control of aphids um, uh, if this technique is used properly, you can uh, produce really high numbers of aphidias colomani, uh, which in result, as a result, any aphid that shows up in your crop um, is going to be parasitized uh, uh, by these aphidias that are flying around in the crop as well. What we also see is that those banker plants are often a good attraction for natural enemies, naturally occurring biological control agents such as surfeit flies, ladybugs, lacewings, uh, because there is actually aphids around, uh, not necessarily in your crop but on those banker plants, it actually makes your situation more attractive for these natural enemies that are free to, uh, to show up, um, show up on your, uh, in your greenhouse or on your farm. What is important to know is that it's not just a matter of seeding some barley or wheat. Um, um, growers that do this, uh, they have to protect their bankers and the next slide I will show what that looks like. Um, uh, number of banker plants per acre is also important. Uh, this technique is also used outdoors. Um, uh, often growers that are doing this are upping the, that number of two per acre to start with and one more per acre every other week after. Uh, I see growers doing double or triple of this because it is a relatively uh, simple system once you have everything in place. It is a system that needs continuity, so it's not just a matter of seeding a bunch of plants and you're done with it. It takes a little bit of time. The first five weeks we release some aphidias to get the population going. And we have to remember that from the moment that an aphidias stings an aphid or overpositioned an aphid, uh, it uh, uh, takes about two weeks before that mummification takes place, which is that uh, uh, brown mummy that you see in the middle picture. Uh, and then it takes another two weeks for that wasp to hatch. So that process overall takes about, uh, takes about uh, uh, four to five weeks. So this is the reason why the first four to five weeks we actually release these wasps. Growers that do this in greenhouses often hang those banker plants in hanging baskets uh, just because it seems to um, be easier, they are out of the way and it's also easier for watering because they have an extra drip line. Uh, but in the field we see even these banker plants being planted straight into the, into the ground, into the soil. So a few uh, examples, this is a greenhouse in Rochester, New York State. Um, you see all those uh, banker plants hanging, uh, hanging there, and there's actually an extra drip line tied straight to the truss in the greenhouse to uh, to supply water. Another setup: green. This is a greenhouse in Massachusetts. Uh, all this is all ornamentals. Uh, this is a greenhouse in New Jersey, close to New York uh, City, on the New Jersey side. Um, and this is what I mentioned about uh, producing your banker plants. These cages are actually not there to keep the aphids in, uh, but to keep the aphidias out. Um, 
if you don't produce these bankers with the aphids in a cage, there's often so much aphidias flying around that you simply can't keep your aphid population on your banker plants uh, going. So uh, these cages are are there to help you to produce those uh, those banker plants. Some growers are trying to do this with hairnets, and the unfortunate part is that aphidias are so aggressive that any aphid touching the hairnet on the inside or this little screen on the inside, it actually parasitizes right through the through the hairnet. It actually can overposition that aphid, uh, and egg in that aphid uh, uh, through the through the actual hairnet. Aureus banker plants. Um, Aureus, I mentioned, is an ex excellent predator for thrips, but it's not only focused on thrips. It actually, uh, in uh, we also see it feeding on two-spotted spider mites and moth eggs. And as a matter of fact, in corn, we often see uh, this uh, this predator naturally occurring, um, actually also feeding on uh, corn borer eggs, uh, so the moth eggs, um, and uh, it is a major contributor. Uh, um, we actually, in our production feed, uh, one of the food sources we are using is Ephestia, which is mealy moth, and we're using the moth eggs to, uh, to feed the aureus uh, in our production. Uh, it can kill up to 80 thrips per day, even though it feeds on, on a couple. And also, um, this is good to know about aureus as well, is that um, it has five nymphal stages, that little yellow-orange one that you see on the bottom picture is one of those nymphal stages. All those five nymphal stages are also predaceous, so it's not just the adult. Actually, the only stage that is not doing uh, actual predation is the egg stage of aureus, but all other stages are predaceous, so they all contribute to the control of other insects and mites. One of the things that we do know is that aureus diapauses in the winter, so it's not very effective in the late fall and winter, um, but the day, uh, this is primarily triggered by day length, uh, and it uh, starts to get past that point uh, around um, uh, the first part of March. Um, so what we see with growers that use this technique in, in the field is that they actually have a greenhouse grower produce small pepper plants um, in four inch pots that are inoculated during March and April in the greenhouse. And then once May hits and temperatures start to warm up outside, uh, or at least not uh, get past the point of frost, they actually release these uh, pepper plants into the field, which I show a picture what it looks like in uh, in strawberries. Again, these systems are not new. Um, it was used in uh, commercial uh, greenhouses uh, since the late 80s. Uh, some of cut flower growers have picked up on that idea, um, and especially uh, during the months of uh, May to September, it is very hard to control thrips with only predatory mites, as they only feed on the immature stages of thrips, as I showed earlier in the uh, in the uh, thrips life cycle. Here are a couple of pictures. This is a greenhouse in British Columbia, in uh, Pitt Meadows. Um, this is a cut flower grower that has been doing this since, uh, since the mid-90s. Um, I'll go past this a little faster. This is um, this is chrysanthemums. You see these pepper plants sitting in a pot of chrysanthemums. Uh, this is indoors. This is also still indoors. This row of hanging baskets. Uh, this is actually an open roof greenhouse in Ontario, uh, Nexus greenhouse that uh, where the entire roof uh, opens up from the from the peak. Uh, this is also still in greenhouses. Um, this is an operation in Pennsylvania where you see pepper plants in combination with alyssum, which is also good for aureus, but is also highly attractive to surfeit flies. This is in strawberries. Um, strawberries uh, alyssum, uh, again, to uh, promote the, uh, the aureus population as well. This is in uh, cucumbers, this whole row on the top on that extra gutter are all uh, all banker plants and the same in vegetable propagation. So what are important uh, key factors with this banker plant system? The, the variety nowadays that is used is purple flash which is an ornamental variety. Um, it uh, produces flowers very consistently 
Uh, it's also a very hardy plant, so it can handle quite a bit of abuse in the sense of uh, not enough water or um, it's, uh, it's a very tough plant. Um, it's important to start those plants early and as I mentioned uh, some of the growers here in Ontario and strawberries have these grow have other growers produce those plants for them. Um, we often feed those orries with a little bit of Ephestia which is also what we use in production just simply to increase egg laying capacity of the orias to try to get it establish, uh, established faster. Once established uh, we are looking at those plants. Um, you see uh, see us here shaking some of those plants over a white piece of cardboard or a white uh, a white uh, whiteboard to uh, look for the aureus nymphs. It's always nice to see the adults but obviously what we're looking for here is the uh, is the nymphs to that means that they are actually reproducing on those uh, on those plants. Some of you might recognize this plant it's mullen uh, which is actually a wheat uh, that grows in a ditch uh, this is actually where Dave Gillespie found, Dr. Dave Gillespie out of British Columbia, um, uh, found Dicyphus on in uh, in the 90s. Um, it's a Dicyphus hesperus is a naturally occurring uh, uh, mirrored bug that is also a generalist predator, just like Aureus, but slightly larger, and feeds on whitefly larvae as well as thrips, moth eggs, and two spotted spider mites. Um, Growers use these mullen plants to try to get uh, uh, Dicyphus established and often when we start looking in the field or when you're out on a hike and you find a mullen plant, there's a good chance that you could find Dicyphus on those plants naturally occurring. I won't go into too much detail, but again, these plants uh, for growers that do this outdoors are started often in greenhouses, Inoc inoculations are done in greenhouses and then later on uh, move these plants outside in the field. Um, either in rows or at the end of uh, end of the rows, uh, in combination with uh, pepper plants and um, and uh, aphid banker plants. Um, this is a grower that grows Mandevilla in Ontario, and you see they are using multiple banker plant systems. Mandevilla is very susceptible to all kinds of pest problems, so he has mullen there for Dicyphus, the Elysium there for Aureus, and surface flies, uh, the aphid banker plants behind there, and he also does uh, pepper banker plants as well. Here we see feeding with Ephestia, those are those sterile moth eggs uh, that you by the way have to keep in the freezer. If you uh, kept uh, keep, keep these, they stay good in the freezer for quite some time uh, and you only take out what you're, what you're feeding them with. Typically for 40 mullen plants we use about 0.4 grams uh, so very, very little. Um, you see it here being done with a with a pepper shaker. This is what it looks in commercial tomato production and cucumber production and again more cucumber production. So um, doesn't that I'd ask about uh, field crops and I have a couple of pictures here to show you about what it looks like in fields. This is actually, uh, I'm based in uh, in Vineland, Ontario close to St. Catharines and this is actually a field not too far from this location where a, um, a fairly large strawberry growers has been doing this now for a few years. Um, every acre to acre and a half depending on the uh, positioning in the field. One of the beds is no longer strawberries but actually banker plants. Um, you see that first uh, bed there, there's pepper bankers there as well as alyssum uh, that are supporting aureus. And this grower is also using the sachets um, in the uh, in the strawberries itself to uh, to control to control thrips. Again, I think banker plants are an ideal tool for uh, for field crops um, to make biocontrol um, more cost effective. Um, it is uh, obviously um, trying to find somebody that can grow some of those banker plants for you if you don't have any greenhouse settings. Uh, is uh, is a market. I think we can uh, expect a market to develop uh, for that particular uh, for that particular purpose. Um, I think all three banker systems are doable and actually would be beneficial to get uh, all three banker systems uh, together in the same in the same settings. 
This is a, a grower in uh, North Carolina that actually has been doing this for a few years and you see all these plants scattered together. Uh, these are all the plants that were used in the greenhouse during the spring and uh, I took this picture early June when all the greenhouses were emptying out uh, with, uh, with product going through to their customers, hanging baskets and bedding plants. Uh, so they gathered all these plants together outside on their concrete path. They have quite a bit of outdoor, uh, outdoor fields uh, that are actually not fields but fields of concrete where they grow primarily uh, mums uh, during the uh, mid to late summer into the fall. And you can see there there's pepper plants, mullein plants, alyssum, as well as the aphid banker plants all together. This is what it looked like uh, in the second week of August. You see that the field was completely surrounded with banker plants. Uh, you can see it in the back there too. Um, and these mums uh, are basically not sprayed for, uh, for insect, insect and mite problems. Um, different, uh, similar setup, but different location. This is in uh, New Jersey, same setup where the banker plants are used in, um, in the field. This is what I'm really excited about. This is in, uh, in Gilroy, California, um, where Syngenta has been doing this in their uh, uh, varietal trial fields. They have about uh, eight acres outdoors with all kinds of uh, uh, new varieties of, uh, of flowers uh, that they actually let go to full bloom, as you see, uh, which is heaven for thrips because there's lots of pollen. Um, and they, uh, uh, they start these uh, biocontrol systems already in the greenhouse uh, in the springtime. Uh, obviously, the ornamental plants itself will get a sachet uh, in the greenhouse in their four-inch pot, but also the banker plants are inoculated in the, in the greenhouse with, uh, with aureus and uh, aphidias as well. This is a year later, similar setup. In some of the fields, they did a double row uh, with alyssum and pepper plants. This is in daylily production, um, and uh, this is in Deerfield, Massachusetts. Similar setup where one bed every acre and a half is uh, is no longer daylilies, but uh, banker plants to support beneficials. Similar setup here. And this is also something that starts to happen in California in some of the uh, raspberries and uh, strawberries uh, where they are starting to use these techniques to uh, enhance biological control agents uh, in either um, uh, uh, covered crops um, or in the field itself. Again, this is in strawberry production in Ontario. Um, where can you find more information about releases and release rates? Um, often people are looking for that information and I mentioned the app. We have an app that you can download. You can look at the different crops and what kind of pest problems and where you're located and it will give you an indication on, uh, on release rates. Uh, it also um, talks about uh, side effects. Uh, you see release rates here per square foot. In Canada it would be per square meter. Um, and this is, uh, this is an idea about the uh, side effects on chemistries. Uh, a three basically means you would kill between 50 and 75% of your bar control agents, so not a, good, uh, not a good tool in the toolbox. Obviously a one um, is, uh, is killing less than 25% of your biological control agents. And then it also talks a little bit about the persistence, how long it actually has a residual, residual effect. So what does it take to uh, be successful? Um, obviously, ongoing, e ongoing education, knowledge, and communication is really important, um, as we do today. But um, I, thought, I know that there's also grower meetings face-to-face uh, -face and, and getting more familiar with, uh, with the biological control agents as well as the pest problems is really important. I can't say that, stress that enough. Uh, starting early is really, really important. Uh, start thinking about it even before the crop has started um, because it will make uh, things a lot more sustainable and successful. Uh, use the resources that are out there. Uh, again, proactive approach uh, is really important. Understanding the life cycle of both the pest and the biocontrol agents, uh, which we did with thrips. Uh, you can do similar things for whitefly and for other pest problems. 
Uh, it is a system approach. Keep in mind that if you focus on one pest problem only, that all the efforts could be torpedoed by uh, by other by another pest problem. If you're you're not aware of uh, that um, that that needs to happen as well. If you do decide to spray, check the compatibility, uh, or if you need to spray, uh, and also communi communicate with your young plant uh, young plant growers is really very important as well. Um, communication with specialists and other growers who are successful is, is really uh, a good tool. Uh, I always enjoy when growers are actually doing talks at grower events that have had success and how they actually implemented it in their, their operation. Um, and communication with your producers and, and suppliers of BCAs is also very important. Um, again, I mentioned that these uh, biocontrol agents come sometimes from far, so planning uh, does take uh, does take a little bit of time. Uh, and consider, last, last but not least, consider banker plans as a part of your your overall uh, overall strategy. So really, biological control is preventing problems and not fixing them. It is really trying to uh, to prevent problems from uh, starting to happen, and it's really people that uh, actually. Make, can make that happen and make it an effective, uh, effective strategy. Are there questions? Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do indeed have some questions. So, uh, one of them: What is a hyperparasite, and how can you tell how how can you tell if you have them? Yeah. Um, a hyperparasite is is um, is another wasp, um, and actually, in the fact of in the in the fact of aphids. Uh, an aphid could potentially be parasitized by Aphidius colomani, uh, which is the wasp that controls aphids. But during the summer months, sometimes we see another, there's actually uh, a few species, but the most common species in, in Canada is uh, Dendrocerus, which is a wasp that actually parasitizes the parasitized, uh, the, the aphidius. So it affects your, your aphidius. So, it sounds complicated, but an, an aphid gets parasitized by an aphidius. When it mummifies, another wasp comes along, and it actually lays an egg in that mummified aphid. So, uh, so that basically means that uh, uh, um, your aphidius population is going to be neg negatively affected. The way that you can tell is that when an aphidius hatches from the mummy, it actually leaves a perfectly round hole, and you see typically you sometimes even see the lid still attached to it. Where as where dendrocerus or the hyperparasite hatches, it is often a very jagged, ugly hole. It, it does not exit very nicely from that uh, from that from that mummy, so it leaves a, an ugly ugly hole. The wasp itself is much shorter, uh, and uh, I always. Uh, if you see it on a white piece of cardboard, if you shake one of those banker plants, it likes to play the drums, but in, with its antenna, it constantly moves moves its antenna, um, almost looking like it's uh, it's trying to play the drums. And they're they're not very good flyers. They it's more jumping what they do. So it's very different from uh, what an aphidius looks like. Perfect. Okay. Um, some greenhouses um, have started using like a pollen supplement. Um, I'm just wondering if this, are you seeing this in a field or it's not really necessary given, uh, given other pollen sources? Um, there is some development in trying to enhance uh, biocontrol agents in general by supplemental feeding. And uh, as we, we are aware is that the, the, the Amblyseus mites, and there are several species out there, uh, to just mention a few, Amblyseus cucumerus, Amblyseus rursky, Amblyseus californicus, Amblyseus um, andersoni and Amblyseus degenerans, those are five that I mentioned, they all can feed themselves with pollen. Um, they all do actually very well in petropollen, but so does thrips. So we always have to keep in mind that if we supplement with a pollen source, that we choose a pollen source that is not, that has the least amount of effect on thrips, and the highest effect on the predatory mites, because otherwise we, we it kind of defeats the purpose. Um, there is a there is a, a products out there that uh, are based on tifa pollen or cattail pollen, and uh, that 
product actually, uh, the cattail pollen actually is very beneficial for for um, two of the Amblyces mite species, um, Amblyces versky and Amblyces degenerans, respond very, very well to that pollen. Um, all the other Amblyces species do not respond as much, and it has a very little effect on thrips. So in some cases, it can be beneficial to use that TIFA pollen uh, by dusting that, uh, dusting that over the crop. I think for outdoor crops, the limiting factor is 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 rain and overhead watering. Um, we see that some of the cucumber growers that do this in cucumber greenhouses, they uh, have to do the application right after the fungicide spray, uh, which they all do at least once a week for powdery mildew. And uh, uh, it's um, uh, it's hard to uh, not spray for mildew, so. A week later, when you spray that crop, you kind of washes the pollen. You wash the pollen off the off the plant. Um, I hope that that helps a little bit. Yeah, that segues actually quite nicely into the next question that I've got here. That um, how effective are beneficial arthropods um, in systems where you may be using overhead uh, overhead irrigation? Like given the given the chance of washing them off. Um, you know. If I if I look at uh, uh, strawberry fields in California, they they have been uh, they have been using biological control actually from an outdoor crop perspective, probably the longest, um, and it goes back to the late 80s, early 90s. Um, now it doesn't rain as often in California as it would in many other places, but nevertheless, uh, you know, even in ornamental greenhouses and um, uh, settings in in Florida, in foliage plants, where they do do a lot of overhead watering, uh, we see that these beneficials work quite quite well. Um, as long as it's uh, you know, um, it's uh, there's no no additives to the water in the sense of pesticides that are harmful to the biocontrol agents, um, um, it, it's not too not too big of a problem. Okay, um, how many? Um... What would be your your stocking rate, if you will, of your banker plants? So, like, how many rows of banker plants would you do for every, say, strawberry rose, rose strawberries? Um, it, it is a lot based on acreage, and what we are aiming for in strawberries is one bed per acre to an acre and a half. Mm -hmm. And I would not stretch it too much further than that, um, even though uh, it is known from research in Europe that aureus can fly up to 300 meters. Okay, um, but nevertheless, I think uh, if you're stretching it too thin, then you might not get the effect that you want. So uh, I will go not not much further than uh, one row per um, acre and a half at the at the at the most. So. Okay, um, and how effective are banker plants in comparison to other cultural control methods such as trap crops, indicator plants, etc. Sticky traps, I guess, would be potentially yeah. in there. Well, I, I think the function is different because if you look at um, these plants are not there to be beautiful or to, uh, they're, they're there literally to try to reproduce, establish and reproduce as many, uh, in the case of uh, the pepper plant, as many aureus as possible. And again, pepper plants, um, if you look at one of the most uh, important market for aureus and where aureus has been used the longest is in commercial pepper production. Um, and that's around the world. So aureus is, is very effective on those plants. Um, I, I think trap cropping is, is also an option, but I also know that in some cases um, that those pepper plants actually have a double function. So it's not only uh, a source to produce aureus, but it also can attract thrips if it is in a crop that does not produce pollen. Uh, because those pepper plants do produce pollen, so it actually attracts its thrips to the pepper plant. Hmm. So in some cases, it's actually a double function. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll give people uh, another second here just to get any qu last minute questions in. Um, but I will let you know that the recording for the webinar will be available. I swear it will be available I, on the uh, on the microsite www.agriculture.alberta.ca slash horticulture. Um, an evaluation will be sent out to you separately uh, in an email. 
with the recording and it would be appreciated if you could please fill it out as uh, those opinions do give us an idea of what you want to see and, and who you'd like to have back. Um, once again, uh, I don't see any more any more questions coming in here. But once again, thanks to uh, thank you, Ronald, for a wonderful presentation, and all of you who took the time out of your busy day to listen. We hope that you can join us again in a couple weeks on December 18th, when we're going to have Dr. Kate Gronkreis from the University of Saskatchewan, and she's going to be talking about soil fertility uh, and all the different aspects of it. So, thanks again, folks, and have a wonderful day. Thanks a lot, Dustin.